After meeting so many of you, I was so relieved to know that I wouldn't have to ask Chris to check the door for weapons. And, all. <laughs> and I felt sure that if you put all the uh, all the tomatoes and eggs and things in the compost, I wouldn't have to worry about that. I didn't have to have a plastic thing. <laughs> We've had a beautiful start to the day with a lovely wedding. And God was love. But I would like to talk about something that's very close to my heart and my mind since I returned from India this last year. I was there for 10 weeks, but everything that needed to be done was done within 10 minutes. One visit to the tomb. And this is what I want to share in part with you. And it's like you find a treasure, and it's not quite enough just to hide it and to look at it. You want others to know that it's been found and how precious it is. And so I hope that I'll be able to express some ideas that might save you from waiting for many, many years to learn a lesson that I had to wait almost seven years to learn in the tomb. One of, or one of Baba's lovers is here, handed this to me just before, just a few minutes ago. I was so touched by it, I would like to read this to you all. It's a gift from this young man. It's written by the greatest author of all. It's anonymous. <laughs> Forgiveness is the fragrance the violet sheds upon the boot heel that is crushing. Avatar Mehrbaba said, Words that proceed from the source of truth have real meaning, but when men speak these words as their own, the <laughs> words become meaningless. So I want to read some things from our beloved about forgiveness. Baba said, People ask God for forgiveness, but since God is everything and everyone, who is there for him to forgive? Forgiveness of the created was already there in his act of creation. But still people ask God's forgiveness, and he forgives them. But they, instead of forgetting that for which they had asked forgiveness, forget that God has forgiven them. And instead, remember the things they were forgiven, and so nourish the seed of wrongdoing. And it bears its fruit again. Again and again they plead for forgiveness. And again and again the Master says, I forgive. But it is impossible for them to forget their wrongdoings and the wrongdoings done to them by others. And since they cannot forget, they find it hard to forgive. But forgiveness is the best charity. It is easy to give the poor money when goods when one has plenty. But to forgive is hard. But it is the best thing that one can do. Instead of men trying to forgive one another, they fight. Once they fought with their hands and with clubs, and then spears and bows and arrows, then with guns and cannon. Then, then they invented bombs and carriers for them. And now they have developed missiles that can destroy millions of other men thousands of miles away. And they are prepared to use them. The weapons used change, but the aggressive pattern of man remains the same. Now men are planning to go to the moon, and the first to get there will plant his nation's flag on it, and that nation will say, it is mine. But another nation will dispute the claim and they will fight here on this earth for possession of that moon. And whoever goes there, what will he find? Nothing but himself. And if people go on to Venus, they will still find nothing but themselves. Whether men soar to outer space or dive to the bottom of the deepest ocean, they will find themselves as they are, unchanged, because they will not have forgotten themselves, nor remembered to exercise the charity of forgiveness. 
Supremacy over others will never cause a man to find a change in himself. The greater his conquest, the stronger is his confirmation of what his mind tells him, that there is no God other than his own power. And he remains separated from God, the absolute power. But when the same mind tells him that there is something which may be called God, and further, when it prompts him to search for God, that he may see him face to face, he begins to forget himself and to forgive others for whatever he has suffered from them. And when he has forgiven everyone and has completely forgotten himself, he finds that God has forgiven him everything. And he remembers who, in reality, he really is. Baba said, true happiness begins to come when a man learns the art of right adjustment to other persons. And right adjustment involves self-forgiveness and love. And in the book, It So Happened, on page 59, you'll find that Baba Maribaba once spoke of, about himself as the judge and of the difference between himself as the judge and the judges of the earth. And Baba said this, The judges of the world bring guilt to the guilty and punish them. I bring guilt to the guilty and forgive them. Before going out for begging on the 24th morning, Baba asked the companion, this is from the new life, Baba asked the companions to present themselves before him after washing their feet. He then went through a very awe-inspiring act of touching the feet of the companions with both of his hands and uplifting the hands to his forehead. This done, Baba made Dr. Gandhi to read the following prayer. Today, the 24th December, is a very significant day for me in the new life. I ask the most merciful God to forgive me and my companions for any shortcomings and any conscious and unconscious mistakes done singly or wholly towards each other, or personally or impersonally relating to the conditions or otherwise, as also for any lusty, angry, greedy, or old life thoughts or desires. I forgive you, my companion, and ask you all to forgive me, and not merely by way of ceremony, but as a wholehearted party. While all this prayer was being read, the atmosphere, one could feel, had undergone a change. Baba himself became very serene and composed, and the glow on his face was that of one on the judgment seat, overflowing with love kindness and mercy. He seemed to be the judge, the crime, and the culprit, rolled into one moment of eternity. Baba made Kari read the prayer over and over again a number of times. All through he listened to the prayer in rapt attention, and then making a gesture of forgiveness, he brought the invocations to an end. That's from the new life of Baba and his companions. At Mantri Mafi, near a Friday the 3rd of March 1950, Baba asked the companions under Plan 3 to wash their own feet, and Baba then placed his head on their feet. Baba asked their pardon for having hurt their feelings. Baba forgave them for any mistakes committed by them. Baba then said, during the period between 16 October 1949 and 1 March 1950, I have committed consciously and deliberately one big mistake, and I want the companions to kick me so that God forgives me. And thereupon he made the companions kick him. Thursday, 13 April 1960. Baba told Erish that morning to bring water of the Ganges from Nohala and took a bath and took bath in it. He called all companions to stand in front of him and asked Don to read the following. May God forgive us all companions in the new life for any mistakes committed consciously or unconsciously towards him or towards us each other. 
I forgive you, companions, wholeheartedly, for any mistake done to me, and ask forgiveness of your companion if I had in any way hurt your feelings. On behalf of myself and you, companions of a new life, I ask God to forgive us if conditions of new life have been consciously or unconsciously broken. For myself, I ask God to give me strength to stick to my oath to the very end and fulfill all conditions of new life 100% with his help. When Don finished this reading, Robert touched the feet of every companion with his hand. Robert's face was calm and serene, and yet very serious and solemn. The whole atmosphere suddenly put on an air of imposing gravity. Barla's face was full of luster, and his eyes were twinkling like two burning stars. In the moving finger rights that written by Omar Khayyam, Fitzgerald conveys the inexorableness of fate. A blind force that picks up men, whirls them about, and finally deposits them in hell or paradise. For no more reason than the wind that carries grains of sand and deposits some on a mountain and some in the sea. Fate has no meaning or power before the compassion and love of a perfect master. For with a single stroke of its forgiveness, Every line that fate ever wrote is canceled. Baba said, age after age, history repeats itself when men and women in their ignorance, limitations and pride, sit in judgment over the God-incarnated man who declares his godhood and condemns him for uttering the truth they cannot understand. He is indifferent to abuse and persecution, for in his true compassion he understands. In his continuous experience of reality, he knows, and in his infinite mercy, he forgives. Bala said, God forgives everything but a promise. And the prelude to the prayer of repentance is, O oh, the eternally benevolent Paramatma, O oh, all merciful Allah, O oh, the most merciful God Almighty, O oh, giver of all boons, Yazdan, being fully aware of your absolute independence and your absolute indifference, Baba, with all humbleness, implores you, O oh, all merciful God, to accept a prayer of repentance from him on behalf of all his lovers and on behalf of all who are worthy of being forgiven. Baba said Duncan out to wash his hands, pacing up and down until he returned. Then Baba faced the portrait and God read the prayer of repentance. At the conclusion of which Baba touched his, both his forehead and the ground and bowed down before his pitch. At the conclusion of the prayer, Baba ordered the doors and windows to be opened and resumed his seat. Today he spelled out on his alphabet board, You have joined God praying to God. God and I are one. And now this is, this is some of my thoughts and some of my feelings about this subject. It is said that Jesus asked forgiveness for his tormentors, saying, forgive them, for they know not what they do. They couldn't imagine such love. He did not curse and threaten. Could they have mistaken his compassion as weakness? How could they bear to witness the sacrifice of one who returned their gift of ignorance with understanding? History perpetuates the memory of past wrongs. The spirit of revenge is kept alive by monuments intended to honor the dead. The words forgive them still falls on deaf ears. Who will confess ignorance in saying they know not what they do? Who will lay down the sword of wrath and surrender to the flower of forgiveness? Who will abdicate the throne of self-love to, to place the crown of forgiveness on another? And who will choose a thorn 
and the rose bears. One who refuses to accept a petition for forgiveness is no less at fault than he who refuses to forgive. Forgiveness does not condone the wrong and, ref and refuses to reply by compounding it. Baba said, Revenge follows hatred and forgiveness follows love. Without love, none can cultivate the noble habit of forgetting and forgiving. You forgive a wrong done to you in the same measure in which you love the wrong to you. Arish tells an incident from the life of Muhammad, the prophet near death, who required his companions to report any occasion that they felt that he had been unfair to them. And he would ask their forgiveness. The companion remained silent, and then the Bedouin, it's sort of an untouchable of the desert, who had served as a scout and guide, complained that he had been cut on his back by Muhammad's whip at the Battle of Badr, that's in 624 AD, excuse me, that his wounds had healed, that his heart had ached since. Muhammad commanded that this man was not to be harmed, because when this man stood up and spoke, the companions were ready to strike him down, you know, feeling offended that this person could have the, he could have the gall to speak in front of them over the life. And so they sheathed their swords. The Prophet's whip was brought and given to the Bedouin. The dying Muhammad was raised to a sitting posture, and the Bedouin was told to strike. And he said, but my back was bare. And with much effort and pain, Muhammad was back to see the position and his shirt was removed. And the order was given again to strike. And the man raised the whip. And the companion to were horror struck. And the man then who never had known any kindness or any love. Uh, bent down and kissed a mole on his beloved back. By the grace of God, this man was blessed with my love that alone can bring the fruit of truth and peace. November 1986 marked my return to Marisat after 14 years' absence. A 10 weeks visit gave me many opportunities to attend Arti as well as to visit the tomb at other times. I would like to tell you of one particular visit. My purpose is to share this intimate experience in the hope that you might be spared waiting many years to realize a truth as I did. As I walked up Marabon Hill, the thought came that this time I should not be disturbed by people sounds or sights. The many visits have become a sort of pattern. I seem to sense that this time would be a real passion, but I have no real conscious focus on what should or what could happen. My invisible backpack was filled with an assortment of favorite faults, secret, secret sins, pride, prejudice, Insolence, ignorance, and unmentionables, and most of all, ego. It somehow dropped away, perhaps as I kissed the threshold. I then knelt at his feet and placed a cheek upon a flower strewn cover. And then I chose to sit on my left in the corner when my body began to remind me of his comfort. You know, the body that cries, feed me, I'm thirsty, I'm hot, I'm cold, I'm sick, I'm beautiful, I'm black, I'm white, I'm brown. I can see, walk, I can eat, hear, work, I'm female, male, clothe me, I am what you are, you need me, I'm strong, I give pleasure. Why do you want any other? Worship me. Then the mind with its demand for attention. 
I am the throne of desire. Through me you seek happiness. I am knowledge, the seat of truth. You are intelligent. Follow me, my slave. Body is only a dream. I am everything. At this point, I'm trying to ignore the sound of the trains. You see, when I hear those trains go across the plane, that dusty plane, and hear the whistle blow, I remember that night, that, that night that we traveled to Bombay, which I told you about. And I would you know, feel very upset. So I thought to myself, I'll hear them, but I must have let them talk about that much again. The clatter of missiles reminding me of the night 13 years past when Peggy was taken to Bombay for treatment, 16 hour nightmare. And then I tried to put my thoughts into Ryan. Not then, but later. I'm trying not to see the tribute's flaw more eloquent than any ball. To not be touched when villagers poor, love filled hearts bowing at the door. Tattered suiting, soil, legs like birds, a solid reverence beyond words. These do not grovel, ask, or blame. He gives or takes, it's all the same. Children come, alone or with a friend, fold their tiny hands, nod, quickly bend, for they bring those little beating hearts to God. Turn, step out, and have a song. He gives to all with loving care the blessings that we sometimes count and those of which we're not aware. An old man, filled with many years of pain, poverty, and tears, comes now to have a moment where he slowly, painfully kneels, wide cracks in his heels, he in sweet surrender feels a bit of divine love. Frame of skin and bone, stomach never fill, heart and mind holding fast to the ancient home, remembering being thrilled when those nearly blinded eyes can clearly see the Son of God shining through the clouded skies. And now this sweet old man is giving thanks for this. In the only way he can. Now he turns and walks away, trusting in God for another day. Flowers are placed for him with reverence and prayer. Tiny blossoms from the hill, garlands from daughter. Lovers sing the arti there, happy songs of praise. They sing in Gujarati there to celebrate those days when he was seen upon this hill. And now in these dear hearts he's walking still. A sorry clad mother comes to give, folding tiny hands in her own. When she carried the unborn one, she came to Mary Baba's tomb and prayed that life within her womb would be brought to birth and live. This mother promised to give her child to the ancient one, and now fulfills the vow and gives her son. Now my heart ready and mind at rest, legs arranged in comfort, the thought came. Heart says, love God, body and mind are for this only. They are gifts from me. By his grace they are vehicles for the soul God manifests. Body and mind are necessary but not important. When the heart has had, has had its say, love God, pick his name. That's the thing. This purifies the mind. Remembers a jewel in the ring. No better treasure to find. Now with my eyes closed so that I wouldn't notice the murals. You know, in previous visits I would look at the murals and I'd say, well, why can I only see one eye there? I should see two. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd look at the flowers on and the Samadhi and I'd say, well, th this rose isn't quite, quite, this doesn't match the one over here quite. Or the heart is, is really a little bit too thin, I'm sure you. And so at this time, I, I, you know, I didn't want any of these thoughts to come to me. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> With my eyes closed, I looked so they, she, they're so. 
The Prophet's whip was brought and given to the Bedouin. The Dai Muhammad was raised to a sitting posture, and the Bedouin was told to strike him. And he said, But my back was bare. And with much effort and pain, Muhammad was back to a seated position and his shirt was removed. And the order was given again to strike. The man raised the whip, and the companions were horror struck. And the man then, who never had known any kindness or any love, uh, bent down and kissed a mole on his beloved back. By the grace of God, this man was blessed with my love, that alone can bring the fruit of truth. November 1986 marked my return to Marazad after 14 years' absence. A 10 weeks visit gave me many opportunities to attend Arti as well as to visit the tomb another time. I would like to tell you of one particular visit. My purpose is to share this intimate experience in the hope that you might be spared waiting many years to realize a truth as I did. As I walked up Mirabon Hill, the thought came that this time I should not be disturbed by people, sounds, or sights. The many visits have become a sort of pattern. I seem to sense that this time would be a real passion, but I have no real conscious focus on what should or what could happen. My invisible backpack was filled with an assortment of favorite faults. Secret, secret sins, pride, prejudice, insolence, ignorance, and unnationalism, and most of all, ego. It somehow dropped away, perhaps as I kissed the threshold. I then knelt at his feet and placed a cheek upon the flower student cover. And then I chose to sit on my left in the corner when my body began to remind me of his comfort. You know, the body that cries, feed me, I'm thirsty, I'm hot, I'm cold, I'm sick, I'm beautiful, I'm black, I'm white, I'm brown. I can see, walk, I can eat, hear, work. I'm female, male, clothe me. I am what you are, you need me. I'm strong, I give pleasure. Why do you want any other? Worship me. And then the mind with its demand for attention. I am the throne of desire. Through me you seek happiness. I am knowledge, the seat of truth. You are intelligent. Follow me, my slave. Body is only a dream. I am everything. At this point I'm trying to ignore the sound of the trains. You see, when I hear those trains go across the plane, that dusty plane, and hear the whistle blow, I remember that night, that, that night that we traveled to Bombay, which I told you about. And I would you know, feel very upset. So I thought to myself, I'll hear them, and I mustn't let them bother me that much again. The clatter of whistles reminding me of the night 13 years past when Peggy was taken to Bombay for treatment, 16 hour nightmare. And then I tried to put my thoughts into Ryan, not then, but later. I'm trying not to see the tributes flow, more eloquent than any oral. To not be touched when villagers poor, love-filled hearts bowing at the door, tattered suiting, soil, legs like birds, a solid reverence beyond words. These do not grovel, ask, or blame. He gives or takes, it's all the same. Children come, alone or with a friend, fold their tiny hands, nod, quickly bend, for they bring those little beating hearts to God. Turn, step out, and have a song. He gives to all with loving care. 
the blessings that we sometimes count from those of which we're not aware. An old man, filled with many years of pain, poverty, and tears, comes now to have a moment where he slowly, painfully kneels, wide cracks in his heels. He in sweet surrender feels the pit of divine love. Frame of skin and bone, stomach never fill, heart and mind holding fast to the ancient one, remembering being thrilled when those nearly blinded eyes could clearly see the Son of God shining through the clouded skies. And now this sweet old man is giving thanks for this in the only way he can. Now he turns and walks away. Trusting in God for another day. Flowers are placed for him with reverence and prayer. Tiny blossoms from the hill, garlands from daughter. Lovers sing the arti there, happy songs of praise. They sing in Gujarati there to celebrate those days when he was seen upon this hill. And now in these dear hearts he's walking still. A sorry clad mother comes to give, folding tiny hands in her own. When she carried the unborn one, she came to Marabala's tomb and prayed that life within her womb would be brought to birth and live. This mother promised to give her child to the ancient one, and now fulfills the vow and gives her son. Now my heart ready and mind at rest. Legs arranged in comfort, the thought came. Heart says, Love God. Body and mind are for this only. They are gifts from Him. By His grace, they are vehicles for the soul God manifests. Body and mind are necessary, but not important. But the heart has had, has had its say. Love God. Take His name. That's the thing. This purifies the mind, remembers a jewel in the ring, no better treasure to find. Now with my eyes closed so that I wouldn't notice the murals, you know, in previous visits I would look at the murals and I'd say, well, why can I only see one eye there? I should see two. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd look at the flowers on and the Samadhi and I'd say, well, th this rose isn't quite right, this doesn't match the one over here quite. Right. Or the heart is, is really a little bit too thin, I'm sure you... And so at this time, I, I, you know, I didn't want any of these thoughts to come to me. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> With my eyes closed, that I wouldn't notice the murals, or whether the flowers were arranged symmetrically, or the photo on Baba. That little one up there that I thought nobody else noticed but me. <laughs> I had no idea why this effort to avoid distractions. And after a period of no awareness, the memory of an incident of my first day of school was clearly seen. This came to me just, I could see it just as I was happening in front of me now. I had no recall of this for nearly 70 years. I had asked the teacher's permission to be excused, that I could attend to nature's call. And the request was denied, but nature was not. <laughs> <laughs> Never have experienced such humiliation and shame. My reaction was to run, cry, to the shelter of home. Where did this memory come from? Why now? And in this place? Almost at once came the thought that I had never forgiven her. Or my classmates. Before any other thought, my heart knew that the forgiveness was given now. At all. And then I realized that the teacher's act was simply a mistake. My little friends were not being unkind. Their laughter was in response to something that to them was very funny. That meant no harm. 
I knew that forgiveness was accomplished, no doubt. But more, with the forgiveness came understanding and compassion. The heart born bitterness carried all of those years wasn't anymore. I was made free. And then I seemed to be watching a parade, a single file of people that throughout my life had hurt or harmed me. There were many. And some I, I had thought I would never forget. I remember when I was quite little, my, old, my brother, older than I, was going off with his, with his chums to play, and play the games and things, and I was too little to join them. You know, that caste system of abuse. Three days over the <laughs> uh, I ran after him, and I remember, really quite well, I remember screaming and crying to him, and in my words, however I expressed it, I would say to him, I'll never forgive you for this. Well, I won't go through the sort of details of these things that happened, but they were many and they were, and they were very painful. But the uh, idea of forgiveness never occurred to me. That's a good you know, maybe at breakfast. You know, when people do things to hurt us, we say that rascal. He knew every inch of the way what he was doing. He had this whole thing planned. He knew exactly. But at other times, we say, that fool doesn't know what he's doing. <laughs> Conscious and unconscious acts of theft, sexual abuse, backbiting, prejudice, ridicule, and so on. I was amazed that I had never forgotten these things. You know, these things kept coming up and coming up. But I, I had put them, they were somewhere, weren't they? They, they? I was carrying them around in my heart all those years, not even knowing it. That's a heavy load. How long I had carried this burden hidden even from myself. But now the thought came, my God, how many are there that I need to ask for forgiveness? I could remember these things. Suddenly a great flood of relief came, something like the feeling when Baba and I first embraced. And then the time he told us in the barn that we were forgiven for all the past. I knew that all the debts were cancelled, or paid in full, by Mayor Baba's compassion and grace. It is forgiveness that transcends human ways. It is perfect, complete, not a trace of enmity or self-righteous pride. I realized that all thoughts of revenge are self-destructive. We are not advised to do unto others as they have done to us. I knew that forgiveness is the balm that heals all but the self-inflicted wounds of a refusal to forgive. Baba is the only one who requires no forgiveness, but always forgives. Forgive those you love, and by doing so you learn to forgive others. Forgiveness is a jewel in the ring of self faith Self-effacement, like forgiveness, is a gift of grace. Forgiveness is a cup of divine love. Accept this draft of his wine, and with the crust of the bread of new life, and your communion is real. True forgiveness is not brought by a fear of punishment. It cannot come from one who claims to act as his agent. No one can be bargain for us in this court. Know that when our cups are emptied and cleaned by grace, they are filled with his love. If those who need our forgiveness, or those we should ask for the same are not available, do not grieve. The miner does not go back to the mine to clean his pores. Jesus did not advise the threatened woman to throw the stones back at her accusers. He admonished them to face themselves and focus to their own faults 
spared them the added errors of hypocrisy and cruelty. They dropped the stones and prayed. Then with compassion and love, he lifted her from the depths of carnal love, shame, and feelings of guilt. He then revealed the beloved she had sought in ordinary men, and with all hope she loved. The awakeness stopped the nightmare, and with a heart purified, she loved him. He lit the beauty of her heart, and the past burned away. The purifying thing of divine love burned the sticks of sin, and the smoke arose as a sweet incense. Forgiveness is awakened by God. Drop the ledger of the past in that duty. Let it be consumed in his eternal flame. Smell the incense. See the bright colors of compassion in that flame. And like the phoenix bird rise from the ashes with wings of love and hope and fly out of the kingdom world. Now, since I probably won't have another chance to do this, uh, and several people have asked me if I would or when I would, so I'll, if these don't please you, I ask you to forgive me. <laughs> I don't call this, I don't call this poetry. It's just rhyming. Something like that. I was sitting in a, in a porch of the Hermitage in Myrtle Beach one afternoon, and, and this came from someplace. I was watching an osprey up in the limb, up like there. And, you know, he sits up there and he searches the lake, you know, like this. And then suddenly he swoops down and catches a Quick lunch. Perched high on a bare limb, head moving side to side, sharp eyes scanning the lake below, the osprey does not swim but launches to a glide, plunges downward for the fatal blow with no malice, like a child at table, talons grasp a swimming fish, surprised to be torn from where it was born, the watery home below, now airborne to the limb, never again to swim, but upward to other forms of life in accord with his will. Consumed by the beloved, the soul will fly, the body a little price must die. Under the tree of life, gifts are found, placed there by an unseen hand. Moon glow, bird song, kisses, Singing, good health, Mr. and Mrs., laughter, food, and other blesses. The bunny rabbit in the hat, watching catnip charm the cat, a family gathered for a feast, a christening, a bris, a tender good night kiss. The addict freed from addiction, the patient freed from affliction, poetry, music, dance, and song. Comedy, the forgiveness of the wrong, and many more that give us pleasure. We count them all as our treasure, seeking more and more beyond measure. But under all this pile of wealth, there lies a package placed with stealth, and in our greedy search for more, we find the soil stained iron on the floor. It's in our grasp, this ugly, no car, ribbon, lump. A Cleopatra and an asp affair fit only for the dumb. And we recoil and look about for someone to shy, it's yours, my man. And all the while, the heart is full of fear. This couldn't be mine. Rather than your time with twine, what I've always not wanted. I'm sad. I should have done it. But then the fault of greed compels us to unwrap. Fearing, like a rat in a baited trap, we lift the cover, eyes closed, and find 
for it never was supposed. The moment of truth is now. And then we see that in this pain-wrapped gift, tied with fears, stained with tears, the trinity of love, compassion, and grace, a glimpse of Baba's smiling face. The empty heart is filled with song. This was the gift all along. It's mine, it's mine, we say. Take all the other gifts away. I don't even mind the cover. Now I know it's from my mother. Please, Bob, when you said about it, help me to ignore the cup. Help me to always be aware that your compassion and love is always there. Oh, yes, and heartfelt thanks for the many presents everywhere that you have given I. What can I say? Pija. I call this people of the world, you know, POWs. <laughs> the bazaar of the world does not thrill the soul that has been to the hill. Where the beloved's form was placed, where the greed of the world is erased, and a glimpse of life at its best can be seen when a mind is at rest and a heart at his feet is placed. If the whole world came to a party, and every song was sung, Food from every land at the table and every bell was rung. I would rather, if I were able, join in the avatar's arty on a dust blown hill, drenched with his wine. Tears of bliss fall on the stone, and a prayer that he might will, that our will may be thine, the comfort of never again alone. The lovers enter one by one, single tune, and bow in sweet surrender to the one. You have brought them from the womb. Secrets of the heart are there, with the only one who truly cares. The mind is still, the tongue at rest, a moment of life at its best. Peace comes. Rest comes. Not brought by death, but in the now of the reverent vow, the soul's true rest. We call this the host. Knock, knock. Who's there? It's me, I shout. And the door opened, and I was let out. Knock, knock. Who's there? A lover, I replied, and went inside. I sniffed the air and decided to find the cause of that aroma. So sweet, so fair. No other kind could put me in a coma. And then another door, a welcome mat, a threshold that I kissed. The master bedroom, imagine that. Already I was missed. Shoes removed, I tiptoed through the door and knelt at his feet. I did not wish to wake him from his sleep. And I slyly thought I'd try to risk the one I had peep. He silently touched my heart, awakening me from a life of sleep. He took me to a shower and showered me with grace and washed the glower from my face, washed my feet, held me in embrace. I said, please, dear God, don't let me leave this place. And he told me that I must, saying I will never leave you. A labor of love I would have you do. Go tell my sheep that you are one. Just say, ah, ah, <laughs> they will not run in fright. Remember, I am Ron, and you are you. <laughs> the flock is mine. Feed with them. The hillside where my form is lain will be drenched with holy rain. The monsoon of my love will bring the grass of grace. But if my flock is plucked with pride, I'll bring you all inside and take the wool and make a rope and bind you to me and make you free. And one evening, Eric Jumani said, Look sharp, tell me what you see. And at last, 
She saw a silent shepherd nailed by the night. Yes, yes, I see him there. It warmed their hearts to feel given perpetual tender love and care. And knowing every living thing, they sheltered beneath his wing. So if the fox of fear or wolf of worry, grizzly bear of care, gives you a scare, remember me, he said, for I am always with you there. Listening to a nearby crow call and watching the bird's swift flight, a carpet of wetness wall to wall, restless limbs and leaves, the constant sound of surf, one hand clapping. Why should I feel the need to know it all? The meaning of the calling crow, where is the bird hurrying to go? Or how the lake feet keeps filled just to the grill? Do the limbs grow tired as mine and wish the wind would stop? Does the beach get with each receding drop? Why does knowing or not knowing keep the restless mind away? Why not hear the birds as they call and watch and see it all? Let him do his thing and put the restless mind to rest. The scene and sounds are God manifest. So worry not, but happy be. The Trinity is one, not three. Living life at its best. Stop playing show and tell, and know that God is all and all is well. I got you, and we'll need a couple more. Well, it's a light a little bit. I call this one moment, please. This will just take one minute, but you can never spare. And there's something I should tell you, for I know how much you care. I know you're working very hard, paying for shoveling for the yard, a second car, a cab left at the bar. <laughs> the girl who calls you Teddy Bear. <laughs> how very upset you must be, more than a little indignant of learning your teen is pregnant, cursing her deception, pleading immaculate conception. <laughs> Enough of trouble, here's the book. Before they put me in the satin tub, I'd like for you to know a few things before I go. You know, the very end, when the reverend reads the book and says I'm heaven sent. I would not say he lied, but it would have helped to know before I died <laughs> that I'm not held there. <laughs> and then a lovely eulogy. Good God, this can't be me. <laughs> but then I see the crafty fox turns them out with the zeros. <laughs> not knowing me before I died, he's not aware of how he's lying. <laughs> Never calling me the louse that tossed his spouse from the house or kicked poor Rover when my team lost and the game was over. And then to hear the mourners say, how peaceful he looked as I lay. <laughs> Hell yes, you look peaceful too and filled with Elmer's glue. Well, now I'm going in. <laughs> you say I'm looking thin? I haven't had a bite since the other night. <laughs> they suited my front and brushed my sparse hair and left my <clears throat> bear. <laughs> well, it's time to go. I hear the organs moan, this is the end, going home to the wall. But just don't stand there and say he was my best friend. <laughs> this is one.
one that came after a visit to the Long Lake at Myrtle Beach after a Friday night or Saturday night meeting. The moon was total. It was October. And as we walked on past the lake to go to the lagoon cap and the lagoon bridge and saw it, the, the lake was just sparkling. It was just like the lake of diamonds. And I went back to the cabin and I couldn't sleep. I was so excited. It was beauty in the night. And so this is what happened. Last night, the harvest moon, full and bright, rose and shot everything in Saturday night. Reflected on Long Lake, there seemed to be an ocean of diamonds for us to see. And then rising higher on her flight, no brilliance of her own, serving sun and earth, a real slave to both, as a must, filled with God's effulgent light, shines through the world as though the source. And then as we deep in sleep forgot the beauty of the night, the awakener came, to chase the fears of darkness all to flight, the children of the diamonds too, for loving warmth caress the earth. How does he do that? Millions of miles, sun to moon to earth, to every sea and land, and for a moment of seeing on the shimmering spider's bed. Why does he do that? An infant. Feeding from mother's breast, tiny eggs waiting in the robin's nest. A dying granny waits for God's gift of rest. Given more love than she has ever known, through the gate of death, comes into her own. How can he do that? A child is born in poverty, plays in filth, never knew it, boy. Ignorance is blessing to this boy. Who did not learn to hate nor curse his fate. He laughed and felt a rush of joy, happy just to be alive, this little boy. How does God do that? A preacher on a pulpit high would shout, If anyone should die in sin, God's grace they would not win. But the preacher standing there was only plain solitary. <laughs> For in God's perfect game of skill, he gives and takes the tricks of will. So, up we put the lot. We do not know the game, when to hold and when to fold. Our fortune we could wreck. Now we have been told, he's the only one playing the full back. <laughs> so thank him for the sun and moon and bell and diamonds on the lake and birds and flowers and mother's love and peace through death. The joys of childhood and every breath. And then with your hands stand pat. How does he do all that? <laughs> Himalayas, icy crowns, Taj Mahal, dancers, flashing eyes, monsoon darkened skies, you wish to see it all. Calcutta slums, the beat of drums, the palmers crawling apace, the guru's painted face, perhaps you think him wise. He knows the truth or time worn lies. The toothless reptile's hooded head, death to the charmless blues. Burning that a launch pad for the dead, flood or drought, elephants mahout, ease or killing toil, bells on the dancing oil. Saints sleeping on the street, no sandals for the feet, no shade for heat, no quilted jacket for the cold, no Medicare when sick and old, no rupee or ring of gold. A hang of hair and a rack of bone, a urinal whose throne. He starves but does not eat. Pleasure, not his game, for this would change the bliss when pleasure must repeat. He lives only for beloved's kiss and repeating of his name. No beggar's bowl, if for a cup of grace. Ivory jewels or spices could not tempt him from this place, where many years ago, the beloved made him feel and know the world is evil, that God alone is real, his only hero. We seek in pleasure, hidden treasure with food, song, and dance. 
impossible to think such sweetness in such stick. Turn away from the saint's glance. This one never read the book or sat in the polished pew. Never like a peacock dressed to strut on Easter morning's dew. He never sang in vested choir. Twenty feet. Who would want to meet this dirty clown? This emperor with no crown. He needs no jumbo jet to fly the world around. He's never used an airport. When in the second plane, he flies united with the beloved. <laughs> His fuel, the seven names. So, if by chance your eyes should glance on one, such a one as this, count yourself as blessed that you have seen such bliss. Oh. How are we for time? Uh, we have about 15 would you share the one you shared at Christmas Christie's on your marriage? Oh. Yes, yeah, I think I can. <laughs> Borrowed time. I wonder why he spared my life when Gore and I weighed not quite two pounds. My brother, a twin, came too, but dead. And here I am at 73, still making the rounds. I wonder why he gave me a perfect wife. Or how he filled our many years of happy life. More than 13,000 days. I wish it had been more. But when two hearts beat as one, he thinks of keeping score. By his grace, she brought me to his feet, gave me to him, for I was hers alone. Baba then gave me back to her. Save my life once more. Gesture, do it together. Placed his hands upon our heads and linked our lives forever. This life of love I thought would never end. But then he called to her. My dearest Peggy then ran away with my best friend. Now my entire life, all those years with the perfect wife was alone from our dear Baba. Principle was his, the interest was mine. The MasterCard did fine. I cannot pay the great amount, but soon he'll close my account. Yes, my dear, differences there are sights and sounds, multicolored lights, bird and tree, me and me. It seems at times so odd, the manifestation of God. The view we see of sky and tree, it's all a place he made for us to be. And sometimes we think it's all a waste. The time's too hot or cold. But he's allowed for every taste of climate, food, oil, and gold. Look, here, there, and everywhere. He hides by being everywhere. But most of all, he hides in each of us. He surely is in everything, in every single part. But the only place he may be found is in your heart. This is for you, Christine. <laughs> uh, not as advice, but as humor. <laughs> I call it, you're okay. When baby cries and your patience wearing thin, put a pacifier in it. <laughs> when old is a child always asking, why? Why did my kitten die? And since you do not know, try a dog in the pony shed. <laughs> and when in the checkout line, your little lone ranger be misbehaves and starts to whine, smiling at a stranger, pretend that everything's just fine. <laughs> when drugs, alcohol, and sex has made the family human wrecks, and seminars on behavior or Sunday visits to the Savior fail you, have a beer and watch the mess. <laughs> After all, you're only human. <laughs> that only gets you every time. You know you haven't been the best that you should be. It's time you start to climb. 
Be patient, or the patient will be you. <laughs> On a couch with a pipe-smoking bearded guru who says you have him to thank and not to worry as he takes your money to his bank. <laughs> you think that this one is the best, not knowing that he's napping while you too get a little rest. This goes on and on. The kids grow up and leave the nest. You say, God knows I've done my best. And when the grandkids show, you'll swear you cannot know how their parents could be such a schmo when you've taught her everything you know. <laughs> I hesitate to read this one, but it has that on the wall. <laughs> this is a love, a love story, and it's about a very beautiful lady that I met in the, on my trip to India. And I think we have lots and lots of people who know about this. Everybody but her. She, she will never know. East is east, and west is west, never the twain shall meet. The poet could not know that I in sunset years would see the morning glow, that day and night would join, made of man, white and pan, become a single-sided coin. The morning hours, too, I have no wish to sleep. No dream could ever be as sweet as conscious thoughts of you. Ten thousand miles eastern I would go to see that beauty rare that makes Mona Lisa smile, a painted clown, and knows a glow at the local fair. And now I try to compare where she lives and where I live in Washington, okay? You in village small and I in city great, one helpless, one of power, one of sand, one of snow, dry as dust, water slow. Songs of God, go-go. Bullet cart, museum of art. Tiny temple, high cathedral. Ring on toe, diamonds glow. Children hand in hand, marching band. Rickshaw rough, subway speed. Dogs abound, city pound. Tandoori chicken, finger licking. <laughs> Fly a kite, beer that's light. <laughs> Not too worried. Hurry, hurry. <laughs> Gurus, TV news, <laughs> cricket, stick it. <laughs> Namaste, have a good day. <laughs> Contrasts are found everywhere, but one thing stays the same. Eyes that meet and two hearts that meet. This is the greatest game. I would be a little child in a little village school, in my little shirt and tie. Never would I scream or cry. To please her, I would try to keep her every rule. I would comb my hair, wash my dusty feet, and put fruit on the altar of her desk that I could watch her eat. If all the things above did not bring her smile of love, I would tease the girls and lightly push the boys that she might think me bad, and then even her frown would make me glad. When school would close, I'd find another way, a dear puppy through the day, mastiff in the night, lick her hand at morning light, but in darkness I would fiercely bite to keep her from harm's way. You are young, I'm old, so I cannot be suited. But in these dreams and foolish schemes, I try to be your scooter. And you would safely ride as in a royal carriage. Papa, my blushing bride, riding through our marriage. If you were sick, I'd be the doctor quick and cool your fever brow and stay by your side however long till you would say, I'm better now. And I would pay the price of leaving, warning you well of grieving that I could not serve you more. So sad now that I'm going the wrong way through your door. And on the altar where you pray, 
the incense I will be to hear your sweet argument. A fire with love I'll be, a tiny spark of light to you, consuming all of me. My ashes falling down, sweet essence, like a rose will rise to let me touch your cheeks and eyes and nose. And when you're tired or sad, I'd be the greatest clown in town, assuming any guys to bring some cheer around. I'd be a monkey or a giraffe, anything to make you laugh. I'd be a little bird if I were able to fly into your house and steal a morsel from the table so that we could share a meal. And then I would sing the sweetest song I know. My voice compared to yours, a mocking bird to grow. Not in this life will she belong to me, but I am hers, will always be, waiting in the wings to hear her voice say, Come to me. Not understanding why God revealed her to my eye, I placed my heart to beat upon her sandaled feet, a tribute to her worth. I only know to gain her smile, I would travel every mile around this earth. Now, if this long tale of love seems fanciful to you, the fault is mine. I ask you to forgive. It's the best that I can do to share with you a hope that gives me cause to live. She is Lala Aymarjnu. She's a queen who loves the king of kings, and I a slave to both who kiss their wings. Her love alone would nothing be without his love divine. I am happy with his love. May his will be mine, and I can see we're one, not three. Now all these things I'm telling you are thoughts I can't restrain, and feeble efforts to tell a love that fill my heart and brain. A gift of grace from one, perhaps to soothe my aching heart, to bring the shining sun into my world of rain. Women of such purity, like the blazing duty, where you stood close to me, Will flaming torches be to light the world with love divine? The cups that sake fills with sacred wine. Some cups he has emptied. They have been made to rest. But the wine flows out. Through hearts that have been blessed by rare bodies love. We should never scorn or blame one burning in love's flame. For all pure love is from his hand. Language, age, or distance, not a barrier of resistance to the ever present power of his love divine. So let's drink our fill and more. Till drunk we lay on the cabin floor, not conscious of anything but love. Then I be. Sober we shall be. And the world is drunk. With the love of wine, and we with love divine. Jay Bach. Yeah.